What Fox News has been referring to as the battle at the border is escalating, and now there's tear gas. You've likely seen the images from yesterday of a group of migrants rushing the border area and U.S. Border Patrol agents firing tear gas at them in response. The agents said some in the group had been throwing projectiles. In the end, the port of entry was closed for several hours. 69 people were arrested in the U.S. 39 were arrested in Tijuana for trying to cross illegally. In response, Donald Trump tweeted the quote, Mexico should move the flag-waving migrants, many of whom are stone-cold criminals, back to their countries and that we will close the border permanently if need be. But just last week, a federal judge in California blocked another of the president's plans to deny asylum protections for anyone who crossed into the country illegally, a decision Trump had a few things to say about. This was an Obama judge, and I'll tell you what, it's not going to happen like this anymore. You cannot win if you're us a case in the Ninth Circuit. And I think it's a disgrace when people file, every case gets filed in the Ninth Circuit. Well, that was enough to get Chief Justice John Roberts up off the bench, issuing a rare statement saying, quote, we do not have Obama judges or Trump judges, Bush judges or Clinton judges. What we have is an extraordinary group of dedicated judges doing their level best to do equal right to those appearing before them. That independent judiciary is something we should all be thankful for. Not surprisingly, the president did not let Roberts have the last word. Join me to talk about this and more the co-hosts of Commonwealth Magazine's podcast, aptly named The Codcast. Jesse Rommel is a former communications director for Governor Deval Patrick. Nice to see you. And Jennifer Nassour is a former chair of the Massachusetts Republican Party, now CEO of Reflect Us. It's a bipartisan, female-focused political organization. Jennifer, good to see you. Let me start with you. Doesn't this kind of unprecedented uh, statement undercut public trust in the judiciary. And actually, isn't that exactly what the president's goal is, just like he does attacking the media? Isn't that where he's... 100 percent. He's trying to make a statement and say that anything that's coming out of the judiciary right now, especially the Ninth Circuit, is not in line with what his policy priorities are, which is only getting his base more and more excited. But by the way, that wouldn't be so bad. I mean, it, 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 ordinarily, a president wouldn't say that. But he goes further and basically saying... Quote, Obama judges yes. are in the tank. Isn't it's, that what well, he's implying? And so what he's doing is he's crossing, you know, this is Civics 101, Jim, right, that I think that the president had missed at some point in his education. Can we send him back um, to second grade? I have an we, old we social should. studies teacher who could really get him in line. Well, he can come to Massachusetts for the new eighth grade program, right? Oh, I, I mean, Eighth grade might be pushing it for him. <laughs> and, and so he, you know, missed the whole class on separation of powers. And so the judiciary, the, he needs to stay out of this. And that's why Justice Roberts, and to his credit, got involved here. You know, but but you know, even though the president got almost all his facts wrong, the Ninth Circuit is not the Shocking. most reversed as a percentage. Uh, uh, even though he got his facts wrong, what he says in his tweet, sorry, Chief Justice John Roberts, but you do indeed have Obama judges. They have much different point of view than the people so and so and so and so. It's true. Obama judges are different. I don't like that he said it, but factually, he's right, is he not? Sure. Judges have different ideologies. That's not breaking news. The thing that's disturbing here is that Donald Trump does not understand that other elements, both of government and of our entire democracy, including the press, do not exist for the purpose of doing his bidding. And he does exactly what Jennifer says. He belittles them, he demeans them, so that they're discredited in their work, discredited in their work, whether it's an institution or individuals. We see it with the awful nicknames he gives to people, and we see it with the way he attacks important institutions in our democracy. You know, your podcast partner on the radio today, that would be her, uh, suggested, I thought a little too optimistically, that with Roberts speaking out here it, and with Kennedy, uh, Anthony Kennedy being gone, Roberts may end up being the deciding, the pivotal vote, the middle person, a la Kennedy. It, is that not putting hope above reality? Uh, I don't often wish that Jennifer was right, but in this case, I, I might wish that Jennifer was But is she right? I, I, I'm not putting all of my eggs in that best basket. I will be surprised if we see John Roberts move to a more moderate position. He has surprised us in the past. On the um, Affordable Care Act. Absolutely, but not He didn't surprise in a, us on voting rights. Nope, not at all. He didn't surprise us on campaign finance or virtually anything else. Us. Um, and so I, I'm not willing to bet on that, but, um, you know, I'll gladly buy you a drink if you're right. But what's that based upon? You know, I was doing a little research after you were on the radio today. 
the examples of people who were appointed as conservatives who became liberals or appointed as liberals who became conservatives, if you take away, for example, Justice Brennan, maybe the most mm -hmm. liberal justice ever, who was appointed, I think, by Eisenhower after his AG said, don't worry, this guy's a conservative Democrat, there are very few examples of someone who changed their stripes once they got on the court, aren't there? Well, we also have not had a president who just likes to go around and poking people. And yeah. I think the more that you're poking, again, you know, Justice Roberts is the highest in the U.S. Supreme Court, which is a totally different branch of government. And so now you have the President of the United States who's poking at him and saying, you're wrong, and tweeting at him. And the Supreme Court is not used to being by name, um, being called out on Twitter. And, and John and Roberts so, is going to issue different rulings because he was called I out? I don't know if he's going to issue different rulings. I think that maybe instead of taking what the president's po policy priorities are and putting them into work in the Supreme Court, maybe he's going to take a breath, look at things a little bit differently, and maybe there are opportunities for him to poke back at Trump while Trump is still president. Okay, well, that's division judiciary and, and the uh, executive branch. I want to talk about division in the Democratic Party. That would be you. Yes, uh, hi. Uh, <laughs> uh, Arguably, the leader of the new generation, well, I would argue there are a few. One is clearly Ocasio-Cortez, and one is your best friend, I Ayanna Presley. Yes. Uh, uh, Congresswoman-elect Presley announced this afternoon she'll be voting for Nancy Pelosi. Uh, Ocasio-Cortez not only said she's voting for Pelosi, but says those who oppose Pelosi, I assume including Seth Moulton, represent the right of the Democratic Party. I didn't know Moulton represented the word right, but that's what she said. Explain to me how... You can be le one can be leading a new generation of Democrats and voting for three people, all of whom are about to be octogenarians. Because it's about leading for the future, and the, it's the policies that will get us to the future, not necessarily the birth date of the person who is getting there. Keep in mind, no one is running against Nancy Pelosi, right? What Ocasio-Cortez has said is that if there were to be someone more progressive than Nancy Pelosi, someone who she uh -huh. thought represented her values better than Pelosi does, she would be open to voting for them. But that person has not presented him or herself, and so she is backing Pelosi. But don't She's you think backing that the ideas and the positions that she believes first furthers her agenda of, of leading for this new generation. But step back from this just for a minute. I'm not suggesting this is based on your personal history. But uh -oh. when you have young, uh, I would argue, borderline radical thinkers, I don't mean radical in a pejorative way, I mean in a descriptive way, voting for a 78-year-old, a 79-year-old, and I think another 78-year-old, uh, uh, two of whom are men, one is a person of color, Jim Clyburn from South Carolina, what kind of statement does that make to that next generation who are not in Congress, it says you talk one way and you act another, no? No, I don't think that's true at all. Um, I think what, what they are saying is that you have people who might be more senior in terms of age, in terms of chronology. But, you know, floating around the Internet this past week was footage of Nancy Pelosi in the 80s and 90s marching for gay rights. I mean, this is someone who I'm not saying she wasn't an effective speaker. I'm not saying she's not the great on the issues. on issues that have been important to these. What I think Nancy Pelosi needs to do, assuming she is elected speaker, is empower this next generation. Obviously, there's a system in place in the House around seniority, but there are other ways to empower and give voices to the evidence that she intends to empower leaders. anybody. I hear I'm, Steny I'm Hoyer. Given my unsolicited I hear advice. Steny Hoyer on national public radio saying something pathetic the other day. He's the number two guy saying, "Oh, we're going to have a committee on millennials, and we're going to have some of these new." I mean, it was so to me so condescending mm -hmm. to these new. You're shaking but and the, agree but with the me. State not Senate with her. here in Massachusetts did a, a millennial subcommittee led by Eric Lesser. Yeah. And Stan Rosenberg was that well, of course, Stan Bar Rosenberg wasn't a kid either. What's your reaction to so this? So here's the... the By the um, way, Republican leadership until Ryan Lee's 48, 53, and 53. Exactly. I know I'm being ageist, but it's a whole different ballgame. It's game. a whole different ballgame. So I'll say this. One, if the Republican Party actually had their act together, we look a lot better, in, you know, increasing the leadership of the younger people. Because there's mandatory we, turnover of committee chairs, too. Exactly. And when you look at what's going on on the Democratic side, I'm sorry, but the new chair of the science... Science, Space and Technology Committee is a first-time chairwoman at 82 years old. I think that they could, Nancy Pelosi, if she really was serious about taking on the speakership role, then she should have appointed someone who's a lot younger to technology and science who actually gets it. Now, I don't think, look, I, you know, I agree, you can't, you could never replace a, a somebody with a nobody, 
not only is there, right, there no, no one candidates who's known, but there are no candidates who are running. So, I mean, well, obviously it's Well, because they bought them all, too, I mean, to a degree. Sure. But, th I mean, that, that comes with wisdom and experience in go. politics and what they know. we got to go. We'll be listening to the podcast. What's it called again? Oh, Godcast. Well, yeah. disagreeing agreeably. I yes. love that. Jennifer, nice to <laughs> see you. you. Jesse, you as Thanks, well. Jim. Good to talk to you.